Good morning, church. Good to see you on this historic Easter. Uh, wow, we are, when you think about it, celebrating with 2.4 billion other Christians this weekend, celebrating Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who is alive right now. I, I really do want to give you good news out of John chapter 20 this morning in the midst of a lot of bad news that you and I read about, really, by the minute. Uh, just screenshotted a couple stories. For the first time in U.S. history, every state is under a de disaster decla declaration simultaneously. Uh, another one from Wall Street Journal. The strangest Easter cor coronavirus clamps down on the normal life. And then even in the midst of all this, you know, the, the death toll, over 20,000. But yet, Jesus is alive. And that's where we're going to pin all of our hope. That's where all of our chips are on. His risenness. And then in the midst of this, seven minutes ago, I got a text. My grandson, Lennon Robert Hasty, was born, came onto the scene. So I'm a grandpa again, and there is life today in the midst of these dark, dark times. So I want to give you some good news. When you think about what's going on right now, and what the disciples were experiencing 2,000 years ago, you see some eerily similar things that are going on in the middle of a quarantine and isolation. Things that they went through, things that we're going through, and I believe the way Jesus responds to them back then uh, we can count on him responding like that in kind to us right now. So let's pick it up in John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Get this picture. Jesus has been crucified. He's been buried. He's raised from the dead. The women have gone to the tomb. Encounters with angels. Jesus appears. Go tell the guys I'm back. I mean, but yet they're terrified because, you know what? They didn't finish well prior to Jesus' crucifixion. And so they're in fear. They're quarantined. They're in isolation. And Jesus came. Now get this. Jesus came and stood among them and said something to them. Peace be with you. I want you to hear those words for you personally right now. Same words to them are the same words to you. Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I mean, here's just something I, I want to bring to your attention. Jesus stands with the weak. He comes to them as they were in that moment. In their weakness, in their brokenness, in their failure, in light of their betrayal of Jesus or denying that, he, that they were with him and that they knew him, in the midst of all this, in, in, the, in the weakest time, weakest moment, Jesus initiates the relationship. He wasn't coming to them based on who they would be or who they were. He's coming to them based on who they were in that moment right there. And what does he say? He says peace. What is peace? Peace is the shalom of God. I love how this word plays out. It's tranquility. It's rest. It's to be complete and whole, lacking nothing. It's the authority over anxiety, is what it really means. So when Jesus says, peace be with you, he has taken all authority over their personal anxiety. Peace be with you. You know, I came to Christ 38 years ago. Somebody who didn't come from a religious background, a religious home, never went to church, and was just locked in fear, was locked in having no purpose, was bound with hedonism and alcohol, had no vision, had nothing in my life, no future, no hope. And Jesus kept coming to me through different people, through different literature, through different emptiness in my heart and my soul, and a few feeble prayers that I cried out. Jesus came and set me free, delivered me from a 10-year, 9, 10-year alcohol addiction. And I've been free ever since for 38 years with a new purpose, a new love, a new joy. Love my life because he is so good. And what he did for these guys here, he wants to do for you. He has peace for you. If you're in the middle of a lot of fear with what's going on, reach out, man. He's initiating peace for you. And I want you to notice something. In the next few verses, he's going to say this term three times. Peace be with you. Now, why would he need to repeat something three different times? I think it's because of the big three things that they were dealing with right then and right there. They were dealing with fear, they were dealing with doubt, and they were dealing with personal failure. 
And so I think Jesus is addressing all three of those head on. Here's what I want you to guess. I mean, this is one point. This is it. Jesus still stands in the vulnerable in-between. I want you to think about the vulnerable in-between. You ever had a biopsy where you're waiting on a call from a doctor? Uh, you're wondering if it's cancer. You don't know what's going on and just waiting and waiting and you're just very weak and you're very vulnerable. Or my daughter-in-law who is, you know, wanting this baby to come for a long time. And she said, pray that this baby would come. And I said, you know, I'm going to pray in the fullness of time. And I said, personally, I want the baby born on Easter. God answered my prayer. So what's going on here? He's standing in the vulnerable middle. The time when you're restless, when you're uncertain, when, when there's that real conflict in the soul. Now think about this. The disciples had walked with Jesus, had failed, and they don't know what's next. And yet here's Jesus standing in their vulnerable middle. In between doubt and destiny, you can find Jesus, the person of Jesus. Look at Israel. Israel cries out for 400 years. They get liberated. Moses liberates them. They leave the captivity and the slavery and the oppression of Egypt. But they're not at the promised land. So where are they most vulnerable? In the wilderness. And yet that's where God meets them every single day. Jesus is willing to stand with you and I in the vulnerable in between. Now, once again, I want to say the temptation is to want to go back, is to, to reach back for the familiar. See, it's interesting that Israel, even though they had been liberated from slavery, as soon as they hit hard times, what do they begin to cry out? We want to go back to the good old days. We want to go back to the way it was. It was hard, but at least it was predictable. At least they were familiar with that. And I want to tell you, God wants to deliver you from that kind of thinking. Check out the words of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 10. Don't say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Your old normal, my old normal, will never be able to compete with God's new and his next for our life. Come on. Verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is significant right here. Once again, Jesus gives them what they need right there in that moment. The first thing they needed was his presence, and they needed him to show himself. The next thing he does is what they need. He breathes the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will abide with you forever. They will need his presence forever. I love the Greek word breathe. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And it's translated from Genesis chapter 2 when God creates man and he takes dust and he forms a man. And it says, and God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and man became a living being. Same word there. God breathed to an old creation and brought life. And now the disciples are the recipients of the breath of God again for new life. Yeah. That to me is absolutely exciting. The Holy Spirit will reorient them from what was to what will be. Pick it up in verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Love this. But he said to them, and you can just hear the cynicism, the skepticism, the doubt and unbelief in Thomas. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Let me just tell you something right now. Hear this. Jesus has never been intimidated by your doubt. Come not on. one time. Jesus was not intimidated by Thomas' doubt. Jesus will not be intimidated by anybody's doubt. And I love this right here. Right here. It's right here somewhere. <laughs> what does Jesus say? He says, peace be with you. Okay, here it is again. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Once again, look at the willingness of Jesus to encounter this man 
of doubt and unbelief. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and start believing. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, to the, the disciples previously, simply showed himself? Because that's all they needed. Thomas needs a little bit more. And he says, unless I do this, unless I do this, unless I do this, I'm not going to believe. And look what Jesus did. He meets him right where he is yeah. and does for Thomas what he needs. And I'm convinced that the person that is really doubting may be just really wrestling with just going for it. I mean, doubt is just another way to say, I'm really desperate. And I think that's what Thomas is doing here. He's desperate for the reality of Jesus. And I will tell you, Jesus will meet you in your doubt and your desperation. You know, when I read this, I think, you know, if a dead man walks through a wall, walks through the door and starts talking, you better pay attention to what he has to say. They finally do pay attention. And I want you to notice something else. Jesus doesn't coddle Thomas's doubt. Neither does he condemn his doubt. Come on. And Jesus isn't coddling your doubt and fear right now. Neither is he condemning you for it, but he's inviting you to reach in a little deeper. What is Thomas's response to this? I, I think it's more of a gasp. My Lord and my God. You know, Thomas could really say, my doubt caused me to reach in deeper. I think that's just marvelous. I think that's just absolutely incredible. It's what he needed. I don't, I don't know what you need. I know what I needed. I needed a, a whole dose of emptiness and fear of the future and fear of death and uncertainty and hedonism. I needed all that and then I needed Jesus to come through and he came through in so many different ways. You know, a couple near fatal car wrecks, you know, hearing him speak to me, knowing that he's real, knowing that he's alive and knowing that he's forgiven me. It's an incredible place to live. I want you to notice what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I think it's a gasp. Notice he says, not the Lord. He said, my Lord and my God. Thomas gets it. Jesus wants you to get it. And then Jesus told them, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, whatever your space, whatever space you're in right now, he wants in. He'll walk through any wall that you've erected, any wall of doubt, any wall of fear, any wall of addiction, any wall of condemnation, any wall of shame, whatever you've erected to try to keep Jesus at a distance, you need to understand he transcends all those walls. His love, his grace, his mercy, his presence, and his power yeah. are available and wanting to encounter you. So I don't know where you're at. Honestly, I don't know where you're at. I got a text just a few minutes ago that there is over 100 people separated in Pakistan that are watching today. Got another text from Perth, Australia. People are watching. India, people are watching. All over, people are watching. This is a historic moment. I want it to be a historic moment for you also, right where you're at. I want you to think about whatever walls you've erected. I wonder whatever life you've constructed maybe to keep out Jesus. Or maybe you're afraid that he won't like what he sees when he gets in close. And I can tell you, if he can love these knuckleheads here, he can love you. He can love me. That's, that's what we're banking all of our hope on, all of our life and all of our faith. And so I want to pray for you right now. I, I want to pray for, first of all, people that you're, you're watching, you're kind of going, man, I, I believe in Jesus. I, I don't really know what to do. You know, it's really simple. You just come to him as you are. You can't clean yourself up. You, you, you can't make any promises. You can't lead with good intentions. You can't promise him anything. You can just come just as you are. Because historically in the Gospels, that's how Jesus interacts with people. As they are. Because he knows what to do with you as you are. And so I do encourage you right where you're at, right there. You just pray. And if you want to give him your heart and give him your life, you just simply say, Jesus, I'm done. I'm done with my life. This is the end of me. And I want a fresh start. I want what the Bible calls a new birth. I want a living and alive relationship with the creator God. I want Jesus to take care of all my baggage. And you just say, Lord, you see my baggage. You don't need to hide anything from him. 
You bring it all. Think about the same way where it says God took dirt and breathed the breath of life into it. You know what that tells me? God knows what to do with dirt, and he knows what to do with your dirt. And he knows how to clean it. He knows how to, how to forgive it. He knows how to wipe it completely clean. So I'm going to pray for you. If you've never received Jesus, if you've never made a decision to follow him and invite him in, I'm going to invite you right now. Let's do it. And I'm going to pray for some other things. So I want to encourage you, wherever you're at, wherever country you're in, whatever living room you're in, I just want you to begin to pray for some of the people that are watching this right now and that will watch this. Pray for your family. So Father, right now I pray that you would encounter every single person that watches this. We've prayed for people, God. You see them where they're at. And though man may judge where they're at or where they've been or what they've done, you, the living God, took the judgment and placed it on the cross. And we thank you. And I pray right now that people would come to you, God. I pray that they would receive forgiveness for their past, for their failures, for their betrayals, for all wrong. And everything and anything, we thank you that the blood of Jesus is sufficient and willing to cleanse us completely of all of our sins. So I pray that today people walk in the newness of life that you have for them. I pray for peace for people, God. We thank you that this virus, this pandemic, has an expiration date. And so I pray that every single person, God, would utilize the time that they have to meet with you and meet with you often, to seek you. And you said if we would seek you with our hearts, all of our hearts, we would find you. I pray for people that are in the vulnerable middle right now, God, those that are wondering, am I going to keep my house? Am I going to get kicked out? Am I going to lose my job? Is it cancer? Is it not cancer? Uh, am I infected with this? For people that are in that vulnerable in-between, I thank you that Jesus, the risen Lord, transcends that vulnerability. And so I pray your presence and your peace and power would come to every single person right now in the name of Jesus. You know, if you've prayed, church, and if you've been watching and you've received Jesus, would you let us know? Also, we love to pray. If you need prayer for anything this time that we're in, it's a difficult one. You can email us, uh, prayer at rockofroseville.com. You can also tune in Tuesday through Thursday uh, at 7 o'clock, Instagram Live, uh, Facebook Live, Rock of Roseville, 7 at 7. Love you. Have a blessed day in the name of Jesus.